Welcome to issue four of my weekly comic video. Got three more books to go over, so let's get to it. Comics have grown some undesirable staples in the past 15 or so years. Heroes coming back from the dead wasn't anywhere near as common as it is today. Resets didn't happen. Retcons were rare. And perhaps the biggest thing is books just don't progress today like it did in the past. Take, for example, take a look at DC. You have Dick Grayson being Robin and then becoming Nightwing, opening the door for Jason Todd and Tim Drake. The Green Lanterns did similar things with Alan Scott uh, when Alan Scott was sort of replaced with Hal Jordan and later Jon Stewart came in, Guy Gardner came in, Kyle Rayner would come in. Marvel went a different route and normally evolved the character situation instead of progressing them. Spider-Man was in high school, then was in college, and then had several stages after college. Regardless if you loved one character or setting over another, there was changes in the books and it kept them interesting. There was a reward for having long runs in the series. Something changed in the mid to late 90s. Progression and continuity was all but thrown out the window. Both companies did have some financial and structural issues during this time, but they both ended up blaming continuity for the lack of sales instead of bad writing and business decisions. Both companies then became more focused with cash-in concepts, like having a character return or die off or restarting the series so that they can have an issue number one sales push. One of Stan Lee's many quotes is, every comic is someone's first. Yeah, fair enough, but that shouldn't take precedence over telling a story. You wouldn't want Lord of the Rings Return of the King to be a standalone book retelling the other two books or worse pretending the previous books didn't happen. Sales in comics have gone down because costs have gone up, story progression is often very slow and unrewarding in the end, and probably worst of all, I can probably find the exact same or very similar at least story in my comic book collection as is what is coming out now. DC's New 52 is an artificial means to drive new readers, but it won't last. The first book that we will look at this week is a perfect example of what I'm talking about, Justice League number 10. This issue continues the story which started in the previous issue, building up to the next big threat that the team will face. One of the driving factors in JLA over the years is his almost constant changing roster. However, pre-reboot, it had become old and stale, and due to events in their own books, the team had to change its members quite a bit. You had Dick Grayson Batman, Supergirl, Donna Troy, Jade and Jesse Quick, basically uh, Green Lantern and Flash replacement, and a few other characters making up the team. This was a fantastic concept. You had the trinity of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman still there, but with different people bringing different ideas and dynamics that we hadn't seen in JLA before. What's more, most of the characters in the team were part of the Teen Titans back in the day, making this an honest progression for the characters. Just to give an example, Dick Grayson, the sidekick who always needed to be rescued, is now Batman and leading the Justice League. Enter the reboot. Now we are back to what we have seen a dozen times before. The team consists of Bruce Wayne, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Hal Jordan as the Green Lantern, Barry Allen as the Flash, the old school non-hooked arm or 
non-hooked, whatever, Aquaman, and Cyborg. And we all know why he is there, although I have to wonder why him and not something like Mr. Terrific or Steel or something. Not only is this lineup nothing new, but now it doesn't seem to reflect what the characters are going through in their own books. The series starts off in the past, and we get to see how the different characters meet up. Yet another slap in the face to those who have been collecting the books for many years. Issue 10 doesn't change the formula at all. It focuses on the past of the characters and their interaction with each other, while introducing a new villain. Since most of the characters are already known, regardless of the reboot, we all know what is going to happen. Even Cyborg, who is the new kid on the block, sort of, isn't all that interesting since his origin was told in the first few issues of the series. There is a second story running in the book, Shazam, telling the new origin of that set of characters. However, just like JLA, it moves at a snail's pace and probably not that entertaining to fans of Captain Marvel pre-reboot. The only saving grace to the current JLA series is that it is drawn by Jim Lee. Even with that though, don't feel bad if you want to save your $3.99 for another book. Second book this week is Green Lantern New Guardians number 10. This will be the third GL book post reboot that I have addressed and is by far the strongest one out there currently. The series main character, sort of, is Kyle Rayner and it focuses more on all the different corps and not really Kyle himself. Following the War of the Green Lanterns book, Kyle mysteriously is forced to wear a ring from five corps all at once. The prominent members of the other corps investigate, thinking Kyle stole, stole the ring somehow, but no one knows what's really going on. Kyle, disgusted with the Guardian's view on the other corps, leaves the Green Lantern corps and since his Green Lantern ring is somewhat different from the rest, he is able to keep going as a rogue GL of sorts. While investigating the reason for the rings being stolen from the different corps, Kyle and the other Lanterns discover things that will change the playing field and introduce several new concepts and stories that has so far been which has so far been incredibly fun to read. Issue 10 picks up a side plot introduced in the previous issue. The Blue Lantern's homeworld is under attack by the Reach, which is something you would know if you are a Blue Beetle fan, and things are looking rather grim. What's even better about this series is that it seems to reflect the events going on in the other Lantern books, even the Red Lantern one. I, and I won't be covering that one. Example being, the Indigo tribe is having problems in the Hal Jordan Green Lantern book, so the Indigo member that was in this book isn't able to respond to the aid. If you like well-written epic stories with character development and changes, then this is your book. If you think the other Green Lantern books aren't that exciting or want more, then this is your book. If you could only afford one Green Lantern book, then this one is the one I would recommend picking up. The last book that I will be covering today comes from IDW. IDW is a comic publisher that started in the 1999-2000 time frame and is known for publishing books from properties made famous from TV series. Uh, some of their biggest successes comes from shows like Transformers, G.I. Joes, and Ghostbusters. Their series are hit and miss mostly, but one in particular seems to be going in a decent direction, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. 
Currently at number 11, the book takes the TMNT formula and tells it in a new manner. While I watched the show when I was young, I really didn't like the series. It has the same formula as Voltron or the Power Rangers. Basically, the same bad guy does something, the heroes win, rinse and repeat. It was the games and the movies that got me into the Turtles world. I never collected the actual comic series, but it is something of a darker tone than you would expect. Fast forward in 2011, and we get a new take on the Turtles mythos being told by creator Kevin Eastman himself. The new series isn't as dark as the Mirage comics, but not as campy as the cartoon. Issue 11 continues the official introduction of Shredder, which started in issue 10, and what's even better, he is actually a threat in this series. I'm not a fan of the whole being reborn concepts of the Turtles and Splinter. Basically, Splinter, as a ninja human, was killed along with his wife and four children in the past, and was reborn as a rat, who just so happened to have been a lab rat, along with his four children, also reborn as turtles. I do like how April, Casey, Crane, Baxter, and Shredder are brought into the fold. It is a rather slow-moving comic, with not that many pages in it, though. It's basically the same length as the Justice League comic, minus the Shazam story. Also, just like the Justice League, it is a $4 book, and while the artwork isn't bad, it isn't on the same level as Jim Lee. If you don't want to spend the money on the book, then I would recommend at least picking up the trades. It is worth a read, just a little pricey for the slow-moving pace. As a side note, I highly recommend the micro-series being published alongside the main series. The micro-series focuses on each of the Turtles and Splinter with a standalone story that goes along with what is going on in the main book. Yes, it is very much a cop-out, charging another $4 for something that could have been included in the main series. However, unlike the main series, there is character development and you get to further explore the differences between the characters. They have released an issue for each of the Turtles and Splinter currently. Um, they will probably continue the series with Casey and April, uh, maybe even throw in a villain or so. There is a trade out with the four turtle issues. Um, you know, it, it's definitely if you are liking the series, this is well worth picking up as well. And that will do it for this week. Uh, sorry for it being a little later than normal. As always, thanks for watching and God bless.